Good morning from beautiful Brisbane, Australia. My name's Linda. I'm your Certified Trauma Recovery Coach and welcome to the Academy for Complex Trauma. Today we're going to begin an exciting adventure on the abandonment wound. And actually, let me just show you. We're going to start with some of Pete Walker's work. Okay, so Pete has this book out and it's brilliant, especially if you've got complex trauma. And he explains all the different dynamics that come together uh, so that we can begin to unpack complex trauma and its effects in our life. With the abandonment wound, it's very, very challenging to know that we've actually got an abandonment wound because it's not like other forms of abuse and everything that we know or that we can see that we've been abused or neglected. The abandonment wound actually sits in all different parts of our body. Um, good morning, Charlotte. It's great to have you here. So the abandonment wound, we can't just identify it and say, oh, yes, I've got an abandonment wound uh, because this, this and this happened. What actually happens is more often than not, we don't know about emotional neglect. It hasn't, it's not something that's actually talked about majorly yet, and it needs to be. And I think it will become now the major focus of my work. The abandonment wound, when it does come up, and I have had mine come up out of my, you know, not up out of my body like some, you know, mystery disease or something, but our body, when it's held so tight for so long, that when the release comes, it's actually very physically painful. But that's further down the track when I get into explaining that. But I just wanted you to know for now that we can't necessarily isolate the abandonment wound because it is emotional neglect. And we don't necessarily talk about our emotion. Well, first of all, we don't talk about our emotions enough. And generations before us are filled with, uh, we don't talk about how we feel. We don't even identify the emotion that we're feeling. We shove it all down. So, of course, our whole body, our whole system is overloaded. That's what it feels like. It's an overload of emotions, but it presents in different ways into our life. And that's how we can begin to identify if we've possibly got the emotional wound floating around in us. Because, of course, with our memory as well, we often face that we don't remember the incidents that have happened that have led to this major wound. And that was definitely what happened for me. It wasn't until I got to this end of the recovery journey where I could actually begin to release stuff and then all of a sudden the memories were back of the specific incidences that happened that caused such incredible fear in my life. Now, uh, emotional neglect is the core wound in complex trauma, okay? So we need to be aware that we're going to go through several layers before we actually get down to the core of it. So in our childhood, ongoing emotional neglect typically creates overwhelming feelings of fear, shame and emptiness. Good morning, Sarah. So when we feel that emptiness, good morning, Chan, we need to begin to work with and see what's been happening in our life to see if there has been emotional neglect. But more importantly, we've got our recovery and it's going to rely on us releasing the fear, the shame and depression, which are all lingering effects of a loveless childhood. Now, if we can readily identify that we've had a loveless childhood, that's okay. Then, you, you know, probably one step ahead of where I was because oh, I'll get to that bit in a, in a minute <laughs> because of why um, but I didn't have a great perception that my childhood was loveless that was my issue now 
In our childhood, our crucial unmet needs for comforting human connection can have us remaining in a lot of unnecessary suffering. And this is the hard part. We don't even know it because we've grown up into adults who become very self-sufficient because often we've taken care of everybody else from a very young age. I know in my life that's what happened for me. I was the caretaker. And so we don't even, we're not even at the place of recognising that we have unmet needs. So can you start to see how challenging all of this can be? Because even if we say, oh, well, I've got unmet needs, our first question is going to be, well, what are they? And I know that was my first question. I'm like, I have unmet needs. What are they? I've no idea. Of course, now I do. But when I started this process, it was like, oh, I really need to sit down and think about this. Um, one of the big things that we need to confront is denial. As children, we had to believe our parents loved and cared for us so we can have habits of denial and minimisation. <laughs> Chan says, I taught myself everything so I can relate to this. Yeah, I know, but I just... Until we get the language and the teaching and the understanding around it, for me, I was like, it doesn't make sense. But then also, too, in my family, um, my mother was the one that I was attached to, but she actually was the one who created my abandonment wound, too. So <laughs> it's like with minimization and denial, going on as part of an abandonment wound because we can't admit that we're not getting needs met as a child because we have no language, no concept. We just know that we know. Uh, it's like I was living in the land of denial and didn't even know it. This is the problem. This is the challenge we face with so much of complex trauma is that our life that we've created is our normal coming out of our childhood and we create, we often create a life that we know that we have things like, you know, for me, it was so crucially important that my children, their emotional needs were met, that as I taught them to identify their emotions and gave them language, I learnt language as well. And with denial too, it's our safety mechanism. If I deny that the reality and let's face it, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk says reality is our greatest challenge with complex trauma, is bringing ourselves back into reality. So to deny the reality that my mother didn't actually feel love for me or didn't actually exhibit love for me is to live in that denial and not face the reality that I had or have unmet needs for human connection but then I also have to go and learn what are normal, functional needs for human connection, especially when you've got sexual abuse as well on top of that because sexual abuse then teaches us a whole range of not normal human ways, human connections, okay? And that's diabolical, to be honest. That's been one of my greatest challenges with human connection is being able to come in and go, what's the abandonment wound done? Um, and we live in this basis of emotions. So one of the ways that I've learned to tell A, when I'm triggered, and B, when I'm acting is not right, when I'm living out of that wound, is that a lot of my responses to things that people say to me are straight up emotional. So instead of putting a bigger picture together, I have an emotion, immediate emotional reaction or response to whatever's happening around me. Now, I've only just put that piece into place in since I went away. And ever since I've come back, I'm now calm and focused. And I go, right, I don't have to have that emotional reaction, even though automatically it comes to the fore. 
And I went, oh, my goodness. So if we can begin to go, right, that's a habit I developed in my childhood as a coping mechanism, as a way not to have to face the reality that I'm not loved. And and even now, it still hits me in the guts. It's like, oh, wow, I, I really wasn't loved. Like, um, even when my mum was dying, sorry, um, and, and my brother and I went to went in to say goodbye to her and just say that. And look, it doesn't matter what she's did. I still love my mum. That's half my battle is that even though she didn't love me, I came to terms with that decades ago, so I still love her. So I still have to work through the habits that I developed from the lack of love. So when we were saying goodbye to her, uh, she was she said to me, thank you for being my beautiful daughter. So even with her last breath, she couldn't say, I love you. But um, for my brother, who was the golden child, she couldn't even say anything to him because she was so cranky with him. Um, but that's, an, that's a whole other chat show. But I understand because she opened up about six weeks before she died about what she'd carried, the wounds she'd carried from her mother. And even though she couldn't say it in these words, her lack of connection that lack of human connection. And then, of course, she parented me the best she could, but there was no human connection. And I would lay money on it that my grandmother, her mother, knew no human connection as well because her mother deserted four girls in the middle of nowhere. So we begin to see and understand that until we have the education, until we have the language, until we begin to look at our habits that developed, there can be no blame because that's a waste of time. What we do have to do is come off denial and begin to recognise what's happening internally in order that I can see what my habits are. Now, another part of denial is that we will go off into our imagination and I've begun to recognise when that happens more quickly. So when we go off into our imagination is when the dissociation happens. So again, be aware of when there's that full-on emotional response to what's happening and go, right, I need to put this aside and I need to be able to sit down and process this logically. What is happening here? So a friend of mine was going through uh, some marriage challenges recently and I realised that my immediate response was emotional and um, full on like, yes, and this and this and this. And I went, let's just dial it down a bit here, okay? You know, marriage is for life. And in the end, I said to her, it's a long-term plan here, okay? There's nothing short-term. And we just went, yeah, it's a long-term thing. Nothing gets solved overnight. And that analogy can be applied to our recovery as well. It won't happen overnight. It's a long-term plan to be well, but it's worth doing because it impacts the next generation that comes after us. Uh, now, my daughter, as most of you know and have kindly shared my journey with me, is married and she would not have married Sorry, now I'm going to get all emotional. Uh, she would have not. She would not have married a good man if I hadn't made the choices. To yeah, I'm really full on emotional this morning. If I had not made the choices to stand up and say that how their father was treating us behind closed doors was wrong, and I didn't want my children raised in that environment, she would not have known that this is not a healthy way to live and she would have repeated the cycle. But instead, through everything we've done over the years now, this is why I say to you, have courage and determination and commitment to a long-term plan. So don't expect everything to happen overnight. Don't be like me, okay? I admit it. <laughs> if it happened overnight, I, I would have been grateful. But it builds character and it builds into us the ability to go and help other people as well.
okay? So it won't happen overnight, but it does happen. And it does happen in the most beautiful way that is kind and gentle for us as well. So one of the questions I want you to be aware that you can do self-reflection with is, what am I holding on to in my heart? Or what am I holding on to in my stomach? And we can often uh, do muscle relaxation, like consciously breathe in and out five seconds each and relax each part of our body and just close our eyes and ask ourselves, what am I holding on to? Okay. That way you're not going to keep living in denial and keep repeating patterns, pardon me, and keep repeating the same relationship choices. I vowed and declared that I will never get married again until I have solved what was happening for me internally in order that I didn't make the same choices again. And it's working. <laughs> I've been single eight years and this is working. And this emotional neglect work is crucial, absolutely crucial. One of the things that we regain from doing this emotional neglect work is our voice, okay? Our voice to stand up and say what we need. And I've watched my daughter do it and it's just beautiful to watch your children being able to stand up and say what they need in relationships when at this point I haven't experienced that. We do need to deconstruct our defence mechanism of making light of our childhood trauma and its lifelong process. So for me, when I was reading this in Pete's book last time, I'm like, how do I make light of the fact that my own mother didn't love me or wasn't able to love me for whatever reasons? And so I had to sit down and make a list of, well, I make light of it by saying that but I love her, instead of saying, well, she didn't love me and it hurts. It hurts that we couldn't even go through this process together so that I could teach her so that we could come to a place of love. So it can be that we've had a missed opportunity as well and we've got to allow ourselves that we will grieve the dream or the hope in our heart that we've had. Okay, so don't deny it, don't lighten it, don't minimize it, don't make it smaller than it is. But we can go in and feel that pain. Like I can go and sit with a good friend of mine and say, Look, I just want to talk this through, everything's okay. But I need to talk this through so I can see different parts that I need to see. And when we do this, it's healthy for our brain as well. Okay. So the first layers for some are the physical sexual abuse. So they're, they're like key pointers of that there's been emotional neglect. Next can be layers of verbal, spiritual and emotional abuse. And core layers right down into the core, which is where I'm at now, are verbal, spiritual and emotional neglect. Now, it's a double-edged sword in some ways in that we need to be willing and able to say, well, this is, this is the emotions I've held on to. But then we're also going to be able to say, I am safe to manage these emotions. I'm safe to feel them. I'm safe to feel a lot of things. Uh, I actually said the other night, I am safe to feel hunger because that was a really big thing in my younger years was that I, I was hungry a lot. So as I said this, it's very affirming internally. I am are the most powerful words we can say. So I am safe to feel hunger. I am safe even to feel love, okay? And whatever it is, um, and another one I was using this week too was I am beautiful. I am a beautiful woman because I realized that there was a whole lot of negative self-talk around who I am uh, that was reappearing from childhood. So have the courage to say I can hear the negative self-talk. I can hear the automatic thoughts and I'm going to counteract them every time they come up. That way, it, within two days, I wasn't saying I am a beautiful woman because I'd moved on to something else because those automatic thoughts had gone. 
So from my personal experience, it's crucial we stop denial and minimization. Otherwise, we won't see we won't see the same characteristics in people around us and we'll keep choosing the comfort zone. So we need to be able to see the same characteristics in people that we've been attracted to in the past in order that we don't choose them in our life anymore, okay? <laughs> and it's a really lovely place to be in to say, yeah, I can see that quality in you and, and without them even talking and I'm not going there, okay? I'm choosing not to go there. Uh, and the comfort zone is because in our childhood, our whole nervous system, okay, is used to being in hyper or hyper arousal. So we tend to feel comfortable around people who are not healthy for us simply because that's what we've known. So get yourself around some healthy people who are real as well and, you know, they can tell you when, you know, okay, that's something you can change up or do you think you need to look at that? But around healthy people too who have healthy relationships so that we know and we can see what is a healthy relationship, how people negotiate different parts of their relationship and what's the one next step that we need to take towards a healthy relationship. I know for me, uh, a lot of my work still is at the forefront of my life. So I'm learning about healthy relationships just by observing other people or having a conversation about how people manage things. But I'm not at that place where I'm ready just yet to immerse myself in a relationship and all the dynamics that holds because I'm aware internally that my strength is gathering and. I want to be at a place where I'm strong enough to keep going forward irrespective of what happens around me because I know in my life I would all, look, we love people. Let's face it. We know how to love people endlessly. We do. <laughs> so I want somebody who's worthy of that and somebody else who also wants to love to that great degree. So it takes time, all right? Give ourselves time. You're a long time married or in a partnership, so give yourself plenty of time to be single and enjoy it as well and get off all of these automatic habits that we've had since childhood that we didn't know that we've had. Okay, so your homework overnight, I'm just going to give you a little bit of homework, is to sit down and challenge yourself to look at what you're denying in your life. And even to the point of what are you denying that you want out of life, okay? Because our childhood can leave us with so many messages of what we can and can't have that we live in that space of denial. We want to go, what do I want out of life? And be real and raw and honest about it. And if you want to go and share it in group, feel free. What do you want out of life? And get people that are going to, in there, because we all do, support each other and cheer each other on and then say, what's your one next step to the life that you want to have? Okay, that's enough for this morning. Thanks for joining in, ladies. It's great to have you here again. And we will do more on Abandonment Wound tomorrow morning as well. Have a great day or a great evening. Bye for now.